Yes, we've got a pretty big event here in the eyes of the New York State Soccer Association. And today we will induct another five people into the Niska Hall of Fame. My name is Dan Martin. On behalf of the New York State Stock Car Association, I'm here to bring you today's program. First and foremost, before we go anywhere, we'd like to thank Jackie Lape uh, for once again opening up the Fonda Hall of Fame for us. Jackie does a great job here and uh, the volunteer help that she gets along with it. Jackie, uh, great, you graciously made us uh, very welcome here in the past. We want to thank you again and uh, certainly look forward to doing this many more years in a row. With that said, before we kick this off, I'm going to introduce our president of the New York State Stock Car Association, Rick Hodge. And we'll get Rick Hodge up here for a few words and go into our induction process. Rick Hodge. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan Martin. Uh, Jackie, I'd also like to thank you, too, for opening your arms to us as you do it every year. Also, I'd like to welcome everybody to the 2024 induction for New York State Stock Car Association. Welcome everybody, all the inductees. I'd also like to thank my board members, uh, Bonnie McGaffin, Jan. or Jan, sorry, Jan, <laughs> uh, Cheryl Capman, our treasurer. I'm trying to find Kim. There's Kim, my secretary. And I can't forget our Sergeant of Arms back there. He's thrilled to death when he got nominated to be our Sergeant of Arms, Jay Johnson. Now I'm going to turn it back to Dan Martin. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Um, if I look like I'm fumbling for notes, I'm, I was very well prepared today. Had notes out, had my schedule out. It's sitting on the end table at my house. So, by way of my console, on my way to Fonda today, I've got a, a quick cheat sheet here, what's going to happen. What is going to happen here today, as I said, we're going to put five more individuals into the New York State Stock Car Association Hall of Fame. For those of you that are not all that familiar with NISCA, as we call it, the New York State Stock Car Association, it is probably one of the most diverse Hall of Fames that you will see, whether it's dirt whether it's asphalt, whatever the era, whatever the part of New York State, every one of our inductees has left their mark in the motorsports industry in the great state of New York. Today, five members go in, three will be drivers, two that have brought the fans and the drivers the story of what happened during those eras, and we got five of the biggest names in New York State that will be inducted today. We're going to start it off with two gentlemen that brought the racing via the airwaves, via the PA system, and started in an era when, well, they didn't have wireless microphones. They did an interview with a track radio. They, a lot of the notes were by paper. There was nothing, no computer-generated lineups. These two guys did it, and they did it old school. They did it their way. They also painted a picture for the race fans that would leave memories for years to come. The first of which is going to be posthumously inducted today, and that is a voice that many people will, will think of when they think of the Moody Mile. I look outside with the rain, the cool temperature, I'm thinking the Moody Mile too. Unfortunately, to induct our first inductee. His son was to, to be here. I just got off the phone with him. He sent me a text this morning. Um, unfortunately, he fell and he's got a problem with the shoulder right now. He's going through some PT and uh, he is uh, very sorry he couldn't be with us, but I'm gonna call on Joe Murata to help me out with this. But our first inductee to the Niska Hall of Fame for the class of 2024 is Jack Burgess. Jack, like I said, much known for the voice of Super Dirt Week in Syracuse. Jack held down the fort there for many years, but he left, uh, he left memories at many speedways all across New York State. He was a regular at Albany Saratoga Speedway, a place where now I call home on Friday night. And when you think about that, how many years ago that was, and it was during the NASCAR era on the pavement that 
many people talk about as such a special time that was at Albany, Saratoga, when we had all the best from New England, all the best from Central and Western New York, and all the best come up from Long Island. Along with drivers from out of state, it was certainly the place to be on Friday night, and Jack Bird just painted the picture there each and every Friday. He would go on to when dirt started, when Glenn Donnelly started the Dirt Foundation, and Joe is, uh, is much the, the same part. Joe worked alongside with Jack for so many of those years. That's why I've asked him to come up here and add in on this. And just to think about what Jack Burgess brought to our sport at our level, it's really amazing and uh, certainly deserving of entering the NISCA Hall of Fame. Jack Burgess. Joe. Good. I'm going to take this down because uh, that's what we do. I, I, I've got to ask for some of your memories. I know you can probably go on with some stories. Jack and you were much more than partners. You were very good friends. I just got off the phone with his son, Chris, and he said, nobody knew my dad better than, Jack Bur than Joe Murata. Uh, Jack Burgess um, had a way about him, the booming voice, uh, the knowledge. He had a way of, uh, I, I still think he's given more nicknames to drivers than anybody ever will. But um, I'll just let you reflect a little bit about your good friend, Jack Burgess. Well, I used to go to the New York State Fairgrounds when I was a little kid. The two people that I remember the most down there was a guy by the name of Chrissy Conamacki and then by a, a guy by the name of Jack Burgess. And uh, Jack really etched memory into me as time went on. Um, I always remember the way he announced, his style of announcing, and his dedication to the sport. I never heard him say a bad word about anyone. He always had a great name for people and always could elaborate on their history and uh, how well they did. And uh, some of the things that uh, Jack and I uh, always remember, I'm working with Jack over the years, one of the things, it was like a teacher, like a professor working next to me. But one of the things he would never scold you or never uh, say anything bad about you while you were on the mic, but sometimes at the end of the conference or the end of the announcements, he'd say, hey, little Joe, if I was going to say it again, I would say it this way. And uh, I'd say, okay, Jack, I would take that to heart. And uh, one of the things, and I was going to finish my, uh, and I probably still will, uh, my speech with one of the things I remember the most about Jack uh, and I say it at every race, every feature race that I do uh, today is, as my good friend Jack Burgess always said, you've got to have a favorite out there. That's how I remember Jack. Thank you, Joe. And certainly uh, there are some great memories of Jack Burgess. So uh, we will present the plaque. Uh, Joe's going to get the plaque back to Oswego where uh, Chris Burgess is a, a photographer there, so we'll get it back uh, there. We're going to send him down this way for photographs. It's at exit stage left. <laughs> Actually, Joe made mention of going around to me. That's a long way around sometimes. <laughs> and uh, while we're getting the pho photographs, I want to thank Mark Brown from Custom Keepsakes for uh, getting this, uh, the photographs. Also, Northeast Racing Video, Jim Lejeau is uh, on hand. want to thank Big Jim uh, for donating his time to put this on video. It'll be available uh, to anybody who wants to get it uh, at a later date. So with Jack Burgess in, we're not going to let Joe go too far, but uh, I'm going to now call Doug Elkins up here to the podium as we will induct a second famous voice of Central New York and across the dirt circuit. One of the voices that we heard at Super Dirt Week each and every week, and or each and every year. And I got to tell you, um, not a time goes by that I'm not thankful that I got a chance to work with Joe uh, during those last Super Dirt Weeks. And uh, it, it's left a memory with me uh, that will last forever. But right now, Doug Elkins with our next inductee. Thank you very much. Hall of Fame, huh? Cool place. I mean, look around. Look at all the names. Look at all the cars. You know, it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and a lot of accolades to make it here. And I can't think of anybody more deserving than Joe Murata. He grew up 
right next to the mile in Syracuse. If you looked off of turn two over that bridge that was over there, he grew up in Salve. At six years old, he could hear the cars out there. So this is something that he's always wanted to do. He grew up in that environment. He started working in 1966 at Fulton Speedway for Bub Benway. We got in there and, and, and at Bub asked you, I think, can you write too? So he actually wrote the press releases and all that kind of stuff. And of course, he worked with Jack Burgess. I never heard Jack Burgess announced, but I've heard the stories, and I remember they did all these commercials on the radio back then, and, and one of the biggest things was, you know it's summer when they're rocking in Weedsport, and that was Jack Burgess, and I remember uh, him doing that. Of course, you can't name a track in New York State that Joe Morata hasn't worked at, and most of the people in here, they specialize in one form of racing or another, usually asphalt, asphalt or dirt. Joe Morata has done them all. Canandaigua, Fulton, Rolling Wheels, um, Syracuse, all that stuff. And of course, he was there at the very first Super Dirt Week announcing there. He wasn't supposed to announce that night. We were playing Santa Claus, I think, or something like that. That was later, okay. But at the last minute, they said, hey, Joe, you're going up there. So he actually worked at Orange County for a while. There was a press conference they had. Joe was working, I believe, at Canandaigua, right? And Glenn Donnelly says, that they asked him, who's going to be the announcer at Orange County? Well, it's got to be Joe Morata. He told Joe, too, he says, it's not that far away. You just go to Binghamton. It's just past Binghamton. Obviously, it was a little further than that, but he was down there as well. He's still working today, as a matter of fact. You go out to Oswego Speedway, and you'll hear him and Roy Sova still on the mic. So all those years, a lot of you guys weren't even born in 1966. Joe Morata has been announcing that long. So for me, I was able to work with Joe in 1995. I was the new kid at Dirt after coming over from the outlaw circuit. And uh, any of you who've been in that tower at Weedsport know how intimidating uh, that could be. You know, another inductee right down here, right? Is right down there as well. So um, I can't think of anybody more deserving. And the nice thing is that he is still working in racing to this day. So it's an honor for me to induct Joe Morata into the New York State Stock Car Association Hall of Fame. Congratulations, Joe. <laughs> Thank you, Doug, and uh, get a few words with Joe on behalf of uh, his induction now. Oop, got me on a short leash here. Joe, before uh, I turn it over to you for your speech, just to get a few words, and uh, one thing that I just mentioned, uh, one of the memories that I'll, I'll always have, I'm not going to say it was the happiest memory, but it's a fond memory that I'll always have. We just talked about it a few moments ago. The final sign-off of the Moody Mile. When the team was put together, uh, you, Shane Andrews, Tim Baltz, myself up in the tower, that final year, that final voice that was heard over the, the grounds at the New York State Fairgrounds, the sign-off, I was sitting right behind Joe. And I had goosebumps talking about it a few moments ago, and I'll forever remember that thought. That final sign-off, Joe, I know that wasn't the happiest day in your life either, but it's one that we'll all remember forever. You got me already broken up. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I remember that very, very well. And uh, it was like going to a funeral. Honest to God, it was like going to a funeral. And uh, it just ended. That was it. Well, certainly, uh, like I said, wasn't my fondest memory, but it's one I'll take to my grave, that's for sure. I know you've got a speech there. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. I got to thank the committee and everyone. What an honor. Uh, I've been inducted into a couple of other halls of fame, but uh, this one is really, really an honor. And standing here in this room, looking at all this dedication and all this tribute to drivers that ran here and around the state, you folks do a great, great job. Fantastic job. Well, how did it get started? I'm going to tell you a story. I've never told this story before. I remember Jack Burgess, and I remember Chrissy Konamaki, and I kind of always imitated them. And I always kind of wanted to be an announcer. I, I majored in radio and TV broadcasting at Syracuse University. I was a disc jockey. But um, I wanted to be a race announcer. And one day I went to Weed Sports Speedway one night, and I picked up a Gator News while they were in a rain delay, and it said, Wanted, announcer, Fulton Speedway. Called Bob Benway, 592-7005. So I did. I called him. I said, my name is Joe Murata. 
I'd like to uh, apply for that position of announcer at the Speedway. He said, did you ever announce before? Well, I've been known to tell tales. So I said, yeah, when I was in the Air Force, which I never was, and I was in Alaska, which I never was, I says, I announced at a small track up there in Alaska. All right, come on in Tuesday night and let me give you an interview. So I went in on that Tuesday night. He gave me a piece of paper to read. I read it. He came back in and he says, how much a night do you want? I said, what are you paying? That isn't what I asked you. I said, well, wow, <laughs> pay me something. Don't pay me at all. I got 25 bucks a night and $5 extra for doing this story. And I remember the first night I announced. The winner was Dutch Hogue in the Modifieds and Jimmy Covell in the Late Models. And I also remember making a great mistake. As they were coming out of turn four and looking for the green flag, I looked over at Chico Ryans and I said, it looks like the green is going to be coming out. No, he stands there and gives him the finger. One more lap around. Well, from there, I went from Fulton to Spencer to Lancaster Speedway. And uh, then I got my opportunity, as Doug had mentioned, down at the New York State Fairgrounds. And one of the things I remembered about the New York State Fairgrounds was a guy by the name of Wes Moody. Wes Moody turned the first 100 mile an hour lap at the mile at Syracuse. There was a guy that was a timer at Watkins Glen. I think he was 93 years old. He had a stopwatch and he kept clicking it. And I had my stopwatch and I clicked it. Now 36 seconds was 100 miles an hour, but he went a 35.9 and then a 35.8. And I says, wow, that's 100 miles an hour. And this other guy said, no it ain't. Ira Vale sitting behind me said, let the kids say it. It sounds good, 100 miles an hour. So we took a break right after that. Then we went downstairs and Dave Wright from Gator Racing News come running up to me and he says, hey, it is now the Moody Mile. Wes Moody just turned 100 miles an hour. And that's exactly how it became the Moody Mile. Then I met up with a guy by the name of Glenn Donnelly. I don't know if that was good or bad, but it was a hell of a great time uh, working for this guy, Glenn Donnelly. Uh, from there, I went to uh, many different tracks with him, and like Doug had mentioned, I was happy at Canada Day, but ended up at Orange County Fair Speedway, and uh, that was uh, quite an experience going just outside of Binghamton, New York, to uh, Orange County Fair Speedway. Another one of the things I, I like to announce or talk about is Richie Evans. Now, he was an asphalt racer. We all knew him. And how did he get the number 61? I'm going to tell you the real truth how he got it. On an opening day at Fulton Speedway, there was a guy by the name of Iris Jack Murphy, Maynard Troyer, Dick Nephew, and a young guy by the name of Richie Evans. Well, they didn't have the electronic scoring as they have now and all of this elaboration that they have. But what they did, I says, man, we got, we got to get some, some of those sixes out of there. So I went down and I talked to Richie and I said, hey, Richie, how about putting a number one behind the six and make it much easier on those scorers? He said, that'll make you happy. I says, yeah. He said, well, it's going to cost you some bazooka bubblegum. I was a bazooka bubblegum salesman at the time. I says, okay, you got a deal. The following couple weeks later at Spencer Speedway, walking through the pit area, and uh, Richie says, hey, I don't want to tell you what he called me. Uh, come on over here. i got to show you something. So he made his guy take the cover off the car, and it was painted number 61. He says, that's because of you. He said, it's now number 61, and that's how it became number 61. You know, Doug mentioned about the different announcers that I uh, have worked with and interviewed with and so on, and Jack Burgess and Chris Economaki certainly stand out. I have announced at races, like I said, at Orange County Fair Speedway, Charlotte. Um, worked with Doug Elkins. I worked with Roy Sova, Paul Smalls, uh, Jack Burgess, Warren Ruffner, uh, Dan Marquino, Shane Andrews, and uh, many other great announcers. And this gentleman right over here to the right of me. And I'm going to tell you, it's been quite a ride. And I'd like to close out just like this. As my good friend Jack Burgess always said, you've got to have a favorite out there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Joe. Joe Murata, our most recent inductee.
Joe going to get the uh, presentation of the plaque, the Hall of Fame jacket and hat, uh, Brian Bedell from Boomer's Performance. Uh, joining in here, of course, our official Hall of Fame sponsors over the years have been Boomer's Performance, the Bedell family. And we want to thank them for everything they have done and continue to do here for the New York State Stock Car Association. All right, the two announcers, the two partners, have been inducted into the New York State Stock Car Hall of Fame. Three drivers remain, three outstanding, very important drivers to our sport. We'll be moving to them in just a moment. Before doing so, uh, Rick Hodge is, we're going to need Rick back up here. One of the things that we do, and for those of you folks that uh, don't realize, we annually, we always had the Niska Banquet, was quite a, quite a show in its own, that we got to honor special people, other than the known awards for drivers, for owners, for what have you. There's also been an award that's been presented, the Niska President's Award. The Niska President's Award wasn't given away every year. It wasn't given away with any criteria, but it was given away to an individual or a group that really, really, really was important to the New York State Stock Car Association. Before we move into our Drivers Awards, the Niska President's Award, I'm going to have Rick hand it out here in a minute, but it's going to go to an individual that we've called on many, many times to help us out, whether it's a banquet, whether it's the Hall of Fame, help, going to help us out here today, as a matter of fact. Going to make his way on stage, I'm going to read the plaque for you. The Niska President's Award in sincere appreciation for your time and dedication to racing. We couldn't even begin to list the things you have done for the sport. It is appreciated and does not go unnoticed. Niska would also like to thank you for all the times that you have graciously agreed to assist us with our Hall of Fame ceremonies. Presented on May 5, 2024, the Niska President's Award goes to my good friend, Shane Andrews. <laughs> Gonna hand it off to Rick to present to the voice and Come on, I cleared the road for you. Now you gotta go get your picture taken. I don't know what the hell to do. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the uh, tables get turned on us and the son of a bitch brought crayons with him. <laughs> That's him. I just wanna say on a personal note, it's been almost 30 years ago I got called to help out at Fulton Speedway for the Victoria 200. It was when Freddie Osmond broke his leg down a five mile. That was the first year that I got to work with Shane Andrews. I have worked almost every year at some kind of an event somewhere with Shane, whether it's been at a racetrack, been at a function, whatever the, the situation has called. More than once I've had to call him for help called him for help to help out with the banquet. I called on him to help with the Hall of Fames. He was called this year. He's going to do two of the inductions of the three special drivers we've got today. Shane has never said no. There's been times where his schedule has not permitted that he said, I can't do it, but he never said no. He said, if I can do it, I will. And that's Shane Andrews. Anybody that knows Shane Andrews knows he's one of the most giving people. On a personal note, Shane and I's friendship go much further. Um, I got hurt a little over 10 years ago. One of the first phone calls I got when I was in the hospital was from my good friend Shane Andrews. And a working relationship, yes, but a friendship that'll go forever. Ladies and gentlemen, the recipient of the President's Award, Shane Andrews. I'm going to turn it over to you. I know it's, us guys just like to talk. <laughs> like I said, I don't know what to do. 
All right. Well, I think you know what to do. It's, it's one of the few times we don't get paid to talk, is what it is. <laughs> and that's Shane. Um, again, now we're going to go to our three driver's inductions. The first inductee here this afternoon is going to be Mitch Gibbs. And with the induction, my friend, Shane Andrews. Uh, Dan, you just took my notes. Are you sure? Open it up. <laughs> they give me an award and you think I want everything. <laughs> Ryan Ross did that to me at the Hall of Fame up in Saratoga, and I watched my notes walk right out the door. <clears throat> Hold on. Uh, if there's anything I've learned, hold on, I've got to adjust this here, thank you. If there's anything I've learned over the years is that uh, as you get older, you get cooler, so I've got to put on my cool glasses to be able to do this. Uh, first and foremost, good afternoon, and uh, I'm speechless. Thank you uh, to the New York State Stock Car Association for that award. Dan, thank you for your kind words. Rick, uh, thank you. I Literally, I, I, I don't know what the hell to say. Really, um, I've made a, a side income and a side gig of babbling on like a complete jackass over the years, and all I can do is say thank you. I'm very humbled. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to move into the serious portion of this now with the drivers that uh, we're going to induct today. And, you know, here we are at a racetrack, and it's raining, and you're always looking for something to do. I mean, in the spirit of competition, I mean, we have three great drivers here today. Mitch Gibbs, Dale Plank, and Joe Plazic. And we can't put you in race cars to get you out on the track, so I was looking around the museum here, and I thought, well, maybe we could have a little competition anyways. After all, we are going to a uh, reception. And I thought, what could we do? Well, we don't want to do shots. We don't want to drink a lot of beer. We don't want to see who can eat the much. But I found something. I found these cool little pictures of the Fonda Museum and some crayons, okay? <laughs> And I thought in the spirit of competition, if the three of you wanted to have a coloring contest, we could do that. <laughs> so I'll leave, there, I'll leave those there for you guys, okay? Uh, there will be no driver's meeting for it or anything. It's pretty cut and dry. Stay between the lines. You know, don't cheat or anything off of coloring somebody else's picture. So just keep that in mind. Uh, congratulations to everybody in the class of 2024. Uh, Jack Burgess, uh, he paved the way for all of us announcers, and if there's one thing that I regret, it's not the fact that I didn't get to hear Jack announce, because I did, if I, as I know about the history and know the stories of him, I wish I had the opportunity to smoke a cigar and drink a scotch with him. Uh, you know, not next to all, I would have, hell, we would have stunk up the booth, I'd love a good scotch and a good cigar. Uh, Joe Murata. Uh, you will always be my voice of Dirt Week, okay? When I started going to Dirt Week, it was Joe Murata's gig. So you will always be my voice of Dirt Week in Syracuse. I can't express enough the gratitude over the years of working with you at all the tracks in the Northeast, but most importantly, I have a boatload of respect for you, not only professionally and personally, but also what you've done for the sport of racing, for all that you've accomplished. Uh, congratulations. Mitch Gibbs, Dale Plank, the epic battles I watched and had the chance to talk about over the years with you two from an announcer's standpoint, it's the stuff of legends. I mean, man, just some great stuff that I got to see with you guys. And uh, we even have a few off-track stories that we could tell, but we'll save them for another day in a different audience. <laughs> Joe Plazic, what can I say about you that I haven't already said, but you're a symbol of a nation that, ex that just exudes professionalism and talent? to be recognized here today. So congratulations to you as well. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you and talk about our first driver inductee for 2024. Born in, New York, and born in Norwich, New York, Mitch Gibbs' path to racing was blazed at an early age. The son of the late Robert and Charlene Gibbs, Mitch was introduced to racing by his dad as he raced late models at Brookfield, Five Mile Point and Mid-State Speedways. As Mitch recalls, Dad loved racing. He was not a mechanic. He would race a few events, blow a motor, and be done. He struggled. He did not have a lot of money to put in behind it, but he enjoyed it. Mitch also added, when I started racing, I did not think winning was possible. I saw how my dad struggled, and I wanted to prove that I could do it and win. 
motivation that would keep up until the day he decided to step away from driving. Mitch was too young to crew for his dad. At the age of seven or eight, he remembers riding in the back of the truck with the jack and spare tires and parts coming home from the races because there was no room in the cab. He would find a spot in the truck bed by the exhaust system and keep warm on the way home from Five Mile Point or Midstate as he did not want to complain or tell his dad that he would not be able to keep going to the races. He was too young to be in the pits, so they would sneak him in, and there was nobody to babysit him, so he stayed in the truck and watched. This started his love affair with cars and speed as he grew up. He was always a fan, but that all changed in 1979. At 16 years of age, him and a friend by the name of Herb Bickford and a buddy built a street stock that never raced. Mitch got involved and finished it up. Herb and Mitch took it to the Brookfield Speedway, and neither of them wanted to drive it. They went back and forth on this until Herb finally looked at Mitch and said, you're driving. Mitch got in, turned a few laps, and blew a tire. After that magical night, they never raced that car again. In 1980, his dad Bob was racing, and he decided to get out of the seat, so Mitch took over the driving duties of the late model. They started racing Utica Rome. The late model was a winning car. Jim Rothwell drove it and won with it. Charlie Castle drove it. In fact, Charlie and Randy Kasaki built the car, and Mitch destroyed it. He never won anything with it. He ran five or six races that year, and they put the car aside. It was a learning curve. Mitch was very aggressive when he started. He did not start out slow. He started out wide open, and he had to learn how to slow down. As Mitch says, you can teach someone to slow down, but you can't speed them up. From 1979 to 1982, Mitch would stay in the late models learning how to slow down. The 2G will be honored today, but where did that come from? Mitch was a Dale Earnhardt fan, and Dale ran the yellow number two, yellow and blue Wrangler number two. His late model was a Camaro and painted like Earnhardt. Mitch went to a track and needed to add a letter because there was another two in the pit area, so he added a G and it stuck. When he was not behind the wheel, he would go to Fonda Speedway and be a fan. He would watch the Modifieds, Jack Johnson, Ray Dalmata, Dave Lape, Lou Lazaro, C.D. Coville. He saw all those guys and decided that's what he wanted to do. In 1983, he made the move to 320 Modifieds and raced Fonda Speedway. Mitch saw that the division was growing and taking off and felt that was the place to be. The guys he looked up to were racing Modifieds. One driver he looked up to and guided him early on was Jack Johnson. Mitch bought his first Modified from Jack and it was a Troyer Mud Bus. On Saturday mornings, before Fonda, he would go to Jack's shop in Duanesburg and Jack would help him set up the car and show him some of the little tricks of the trade to go faster. Invaluable lessons from a man that knew the track so well. Reflecting the back on the first time lining up against the guys he looked up to, Mitch was nervous and excited. Mitch believes both of the doors on his modified were laying at the track at the end of the race because those guys blew by him so fast. In 1984, he won the Fonda 320 Modified Track Championship. In the big race at the end of the year for the division, his heroes were in that event. A shining moment for an up-and-coming competitor. Throughout his career, Mitch has raced small block and big block modifieds all over the Northeast, accumulating 179 feature wins. He won on the big tracks. Mitch went, from big, block, went big block racing with Skip Seymour, Mitch admits it was a still a learning curve racing at Canandaigua, Weedsport, and Rolling Wheels against established guys like Joe Plazic. Mitch looks back and admits they did not run the best, but he gained valuable experience. Mitch's specialty was the short tracks. The bull rings, where he had to be up on the wheel each and every lap. He was a short track specialist in the modifieds. He loved the race of the bull rings that took finesse. He liked it because of the challenge. You're in a corner, you take a breath, you're in another corner. How to restart, thinking ahead, calculating your moves. It sharpened his reflexes, reflexes and reaction time. Short tracks taught him how to race clean. You could not bump and bang, you had to keep the car straight, saving your tires for the right time to go. He focused on being the only one out there to keep his momentum. You can't play defense, it slows you down. 
Mitch learned he did not need all the power but the talent. Winning to him did not come naturally, but he learned how to do it on the short tracks. As I mentioned, 179 feature wins, 14 track titles, pretty impressive for a guy who thought he could never win a race. Mitch just turned 61 years old a few weeks ago. When asked what his biggest racing accomplishment was, Mitch responded, getting sponsors and taking care of them. He had a lot of help that he could not have done by himself. He enjoyed the companies he represented, how the car was designed for attending company functions. A lot of good guys could win races, but not all could take care of their sponsors. His on-track accomplishments include winning the track championships at Fulton Speedway and Utica Rome Speedway in 1996, which were both NASCAR sanctioned, resulting in being runner-up in the 96 NASCAR region. Winning the $10,000 to win Big Block Oktoberfest at Hagerstown Speedway in 99. Two series championships, which include the Race of Champions Combined Series in 2005 and the Race of Champions North Series in 2006. Winning the Southern Tier 100 twice at Five Mile Point in 2002 and 2004. Having the most modified wins at Afton with 70. And winning the Ice Jam at Fonda Speedway in 2006. This race stands out as Mitch was running seventh with a few laps to go and a lap car got into the wall and came back down the track and took out the leader to fifth place. With the field lined back up, Matt DiLorenzo was the leader with Mitch in second. And Matt had a tire going down and Mitch thought to himself, again, calculating. Looking at the restart, he thought, I can get him. He's going to push up the track. And sure enough, that's exactly what happened and Mitch won the race. It's been a couple of years since he last raced as he decided it was time because he could not get out of the race car. A bad back and other injuries throughout his career caught up to him. There were nights where he tried to get out of the seat and it felt like was, someone was stabbing him in the back, immense pain. Sometimes it would take him a half hour to 45 minutes to get out of the car. Lots of racing injuries to his lower back, a few concussions along the way, and he knew it was time not to hurt himself or others. Mitch has not been to a race since he stopped racing. The transition, when done, it was tough because he did it so long. Today, Mitch and his wife Dawn have a camp in Sylvan Beach, so that helps to keep his mind off it. The Gibbs children were always a fixture at the tracks with him and Dawn. Daughter Danielle married a racer and is still as passionate as ever. And a pretty good one too, bro. Daughter Heather is happily married, and Mitch's grandson raced Mike Rods for a while. Son Todd, who served as his dad's crew chief, is still involved. The passion his kids have for racing came from Mitch's dedication and sacrifice for the sport he loved. This truly is a family sport, and today we recognize all the members of the Gibbs family with recognition as their racing hero is inducted into the Hall of Fame. Please welcome the newest member of the New York State Stock Car Association Hall of Fame, Mitch Gibbs. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm going to turn it back over to Dan. He's going to take you through the interview process. Is that okay? We'll get the All right. Get the pictures first. Walk it out of the way. Uh, Mitch, don't forget, you got three credentials. <laughs> <laughs> we did different colors. I didn't find a green one at the racetrack. It's probably bad luck. So again, Mitch Gibbs, the first of our three drivers to be inducted here this afternoon. Shane will set the hardware down, but Mitch, uh, Shane just made mention you, uh, you don't frequent yourself at the racetracks these days, which many drivers, that's uh, their way of getting away. But here you are at Fonda Speedway. I remember it well when uh, the kid from down in Sherburn uh, came up here in the 320s. You showed up, up uh, you and the kid by the name of Decker were in the 320s then, and uh, you two guys came on, both protégés of Jack Johnson. Um, 
both go on to Hall of Fame careers, but uh, give me your thoughts about being back at Fonda Speedway. Yeah, it's been since 06 since I've raced here, and um, I've always loved this place. Uh, had a few bad crashes here, and um, that's the only track that I ever went away in an ambulance at. Um, but uh, I've always loved this place, a lot of history. Um, a lot of my heroes raced here, you know, and um, this is amazing here, what they've done here. Jackie Lape, I, good job. Yeah, certainly is, and uh, I don't mean to cut you off there. Uh, no. When we think about keeping the memories, and now you are a Hall of Famer, has it had any time to set in yet since uh, you were given the, the, the word that you were going to be enshrined? Uh, yeah, you know, it has, and um, I've thought a lot about it, and, um, you know, there's a lot of big names up there that, you know, I'm on that list now, so, and uh, a lot of my heroes and stuff, and, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's cool. I'd like to thank everybody here for coming today. My family here, right in the front row, um, Niska, um, just everybody involved. Well, you've left us uh, all with a lot of great memories. Uh, as Shane said, uh, you had that corporate side to you, too. You had some great sponsors. You teamed up with some great owners. Uh, you know, we think about Skip Seymour and, uh, and what he added as, as uh, the things that he added to racing without needing to be a guy that was out in front of people. Um, you had great people around you. You showed the success and uh, certainly shows up on paper. I know, uh, like Shane said, uh, we're going to honor another guy that you guys banged some bars an awful, awful many times uh, on the old uh, outlaw circuit, the NASCAR circuit. Um, but um, again, on, on our behalf, the New York State Stock Car Association, we welcome you in the Hall of Fame and uh, thanks for the memories. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, our first of the three drivers, Mitch Gibbs. Next driver to be enshrined, I we kind of gave it away, who's going to be next. It's going to be a guy who raced side by side with Mitch for many, many years on the, I still call it the outlaw circuit, it was the NASCAR circuit at the time, but in the Fulton and uh, Utica Rome days, uh, the era of the small block racing where uh, it was last year, Roger Phelps was inducted here. And I think of the competition back there. I think of the, the, uh, the interview that I did with Roger here, and he, he actually, he talked about uh, both Mitch and, and upcoming uh, Dale. Um, just the competition from back in those days. Uh, it's something that has left a mark. When we talked about, and I should make mention, and I gotta pull my sheet out, because I don't wanna leave anybody out, because I'm pretty good about that, and walking away and start kicking myself. We have a Hall of Fame committee. The New York State Stock Car Association Hall of Fame Committee meets every year, October, November, as we get down to the end of the year to talk about the class that'll be enshrined to the next year. That Hall of Fame Committee includes our president, Rick Hodge, Ron Zerba, Frank Mackay, Brian Bedell, Nick Ronka, and remotely, now he lives in Florida, Andy Hickok. Every year we start talking about a list and who we want to put into the Hall of Fame this year. Unfortunately, uh, time uh, kind of constraints us to four, maybe five recipients a year. The list, let me tell you, we don't put a dent in it. But when we talk about what certain drivers, certain owners, certain mechanics, certain crew people, whether they're media people, what, whatever it is, we start talking about them and they immediately lead to other drivers or people that raced with them. When we talked this year and the name Mitch Gibbs came up, the name Dale Plank came right up with him. We couldn't see not putting Dale Plank in the same year we put Mitch Gibbs in because of the epic battles, as Shane put it, each and every week, and it happened for years. They were two of the most talented, cleanest, but hard-nosed racers there were. And the next inductee to the Niska Hall of Fame is Dale Plank. I believe Brandon? I'm sorry? Oh, Steve, I'm sorry. That, uh, I did get the note. I got the memo, Steve. It's on my notes at home. But a longtime friend of Dale Plank. Um, can I jump? Steve Williams. There we go. I did have it down on paper. Steve, are you are going to induct your good friend and, uh, and as, as I said, one talented driver. I'll turn it over to you to induct our next inductee, Dale Plank. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. 
Uh, quite humbled to be here today. I met D Dale's dad in 1975, and it was shortly thereafter I finally met Dale. He was about five years old. And I became real good friends with the family and started working on Denny's race cars. Dale loved to come to the garage when he could and hang out and climb in the race cars. And he brought his box of matchbox cars and he'd go out in the, the office of the used car lot and set up his own little race tracks and race the cars around. And as time passed, his mom started taking him to the races and he took them with him. And he set his own little race tracks up on the bleachers, not paying a lot of attention to what his dad was doing on the racetrack. But as time passed, he got more interested in what was going on, and he had more questions to his dad about, about racing. And finally, then he decided that, you know, maybe, maybe we can get him started. Didn't want to do micro rides. Maybe we'll start him in go-karts. So he picked up an old dark cart, a bunch of pieces, and he, he told Dale from the get-go, he was still pretty young, if you're going to race, you're going to work on it yourself along with us, and you're going to figure it all out. You know, if you can't help, you're not going to get to do it. So we got, he got the cart together, and we both were going to drive it a little bit. Well, it didn't turn out to be too much of a cart, and every time we go somewhere, we broke something. But, but his dad saw potential, so his dad bought some better equipment and got pretty deep into the karting, and as time passed, Dale became a big champion in go-karts. I think the final year he raced, the last couple of years, he wanted to race the Open Class of Paradise, and here he is, 15 or so years old, and he's out there whipping the adults because the open class was adults. And he was putting a whipping on them, and it was kind of cool because he got paid to win in that class. There was money. So he quite liked that. Well, over time, racing with Denny, he had bought and sold different cars. He had a four-cylinder modified then. But he decided that it was time for him to back out if Dale was going to continue. So he sold it. Well, when Dale's getting towards the end of his career, he thought, you know, Dad, I'd, I'd kind of like to try the four-cylinder stuff. Well, his dad told him, you can look, we can find a car, you got some money saved, you, you're going to buy it. And he did. Well, put Russell parts together, got the car going. Again, we were both going to drive it a little bit. Well, they didn't turn out too well, but his dad decided that, you know, I think we need something better. So he ended up buying a wrecked Lindblad Asphalt Mini out of New England states. And Donnie Bushbacker Jr. put a front clip on it, and we put it in the shop, and we all dug in and turned it into a dirt car with pretty good success. We did have some mechanical failures under the hood occasionally, but when we didn't, Dale was out front, Dundee, five mile, went to Penn Can, went to Devil's Bowl, raced it around quite a bit. In the meantime, Dad decided, well, I'm gonna buy I'm going to buy modified. So he finds Corky Stockham had a car left over from the auction. So we bought it. So we pieced it together. So on a given night at Dundee, he raced both cars. Not any great success initially, but got better as time. And his dad says, well, we're going to buy a brand new Olsen car. So we buy a brand new 1988 Olsen car. Put that together. Things are starting to come around again. Bought an 89 car. One night, Fulton, he won the feature, and that was the start of it all. The wins didn't come easy, but more wins came as time passed. Then it was time, you know, we got to do better. We're going to get a Troyer mud bus. So we bought the first mud bus, and we thought, well, you know, we'll just put it together. We still had an Olsen car. We'll go race Dundee. Use that there. Well, it worked so good the first night, we took it to Fulton. And out of the box, it was wicked fast. And in no time, the wind started to rack up. Well, that was the start of the NASCAR Regional Series, of which Dale won it, the, the region, three years in a row. The fourth year, he finished second. But there was many wins, upwards of 20 each year. In between that, after the first banquet in 94, he had to pick himself up after the banquet that night and load himself in the car and drive to Charlotte, North Carolina, because he was going to participate in the Richard Petty Driving School, like within a day or so, which turned out to be a big boost for him. He ended up turning the fast time in his, his class. He had the fastest speeds in his class. He wanted to go faster, but the, the instructor said, you got to follow me. You can't pull out of line. you got to stay behind me, which he did. 
but he wanted to go faster. So that kind of led to being contacted about driving an asphalt car, a late model style car, is Spencer Speedway, which he did for a whole season with pretty darn good success. It really, it really worked, you know. And of course, back in that time in 94, he won the Victoria 200, which was a great honor. And as the, as the outlaw circuit went away, though, he still continued, he ran in Fulton and Utica and wherever, wherever the, they took him, he liked to race. And he became better and better and better. In 97 or so, I was deciding I'd done this long enough, it was time for me to back away a little bit. But I never was gonna not know what's going on. And he ventured out on his own, and then he went from his own to driving for some other drivers, big blocks, small blocks. He dabbled a little bit in late models. He got in a sprint car, he drove Speedster. So he got pretty diverse with a great career. But time caught up to him, and he says, I'm getting a little tired, and my body's getting a little beat up. And, you know, I'm thinking it's maybe time to start backing away. Well, he always kind of had an interest in helping the young new drivers. So he started kind of, he'd be known as the coach, whether it be driving, chassis setups, weekly maintenance, and he started doing that, which he really enjoyed, not really missing the driver's seat all that much. Now today he still does that, and working alongside his son Brandon, the, the Dig Race products, those guys work their tail off seven days a week this time of year, they could be there from eight, nine in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, building shacks, setting up chassis. Weekend comes, traveling off to who knows where to help, help guys at the tracks. And I'm really proud to be standing here. And Dale, you are the next inductee into the Hall of Fame. Thank you, Steve. Dale Plank, our next inductee. Come on up, Dale as he's going to make his way up here. We'll get a few words with him after he uh, gets presented the plaque and the jacket. Again, want to thank Boomer's Performance for the uh, jackets for their Hall of Famers. As he'll get presented the plaque, our NISCA president, Rick Hodge and Brian Bedell from Boomer's Performance. And the second of our three drivers inducted, Dale Plank. And Dale, uh, probably one of the coolest nicknames that, uh, that we've had in racing, the natural. Of course, your dad, Denny, a very accomplished racer. Um, you know, Steve just talked about racing at Devil's Bowl. I raced against you in 1984, that was, uh, up at Devil's Bowl in the Mini. And it was, uh, hey, that's Denny Plank's kid. I hesitate to use the word I raced with you. It was more like chased with you. But um, it, uh, your career, uh, so diverse, uh, as Steve just documented. And, uh, Steve did a great job with no notes. I, I, he's got my admiration. <laughs> he, knows well. he knows you well, that's for sure. Um, reflect a little bit uh, on some of the racing, some of the memories. Uh, one of the things that Shane talked about um, when he was talking to Mitch about his favorite win or his favorite memory um, you've got some pretty big trophies at home uh, with the NASCAR championships and what have you, the track championships. Uh, you had a lot of great results, but uh, do you have a favorite? I got a bunch. All the first wins, um, obviously the Victoria 200 was, was huge. Um, NASCAR championships, which that, that, was, that was pretty unique because we were, I was going to run Fulton and Utica Rome anyway, and then NASCAR sanctioning came in, and I think we were all at the, at the initial meeting, and you were there too, Mitch, and they said NASCAR's coming in, and they showed us this guy that won the region, and I think we were all like, well, no, none of us are ever going to do any of that. So that, that was pretty cool to be able at that point to put a bunch of wins together for a few years and, and actually get that 
Yeah, when you get to go to the NASCAR banquet and you get the trophy that's taller than you are with a big paycheck to go with it, that's pretty cool. Yeah, it was it was super cool, you know, um, racing two two nights a week, an hour away from home for for that kind of money and, and prestige was very special. Now the deal with Brandon, uh, and, uh, and, and Steve documented that pretty well. Uh, you're passing along your knowledge. Obviously, uh, Brandon got some of that knowledge genetically, but uh, you guys work in to help others. Um, I know from me being at Albany, Saratoga every Friday night over the years, you've been up there for a number of years, uh, uh, helping some of the guys on a local level. And uh, yes, it's a business, but it's also a lifestyle. Yeah, it's definitely a lifestyle. Um, I, I always raced kind of for a living, so I kind of needed to do something to stay in racing. So um, the consulting side, you know, I, I definitely remember when I was first getting started and I didn't have a lot of people to lean on, had to figure a lot of stuff out on my own. So being able to, to work with, you know, multiple, pretty much, just about hundreds of drivers now, I think, pretty much. Um, is, is super cool because I was in their place once, you know, guys that were just getting started that, that need to really figure everything out all the way to guys that are experienced and, and just need kind of an outside look in at their operation and see if we can make it better. And um, that it's, it's very fulfilling. And, you know, when, when somebody I help wins, I kind of feel like a little victory for myself. So that's pretty cool. And it's all part of the threads that makes up a Hall of Famer. It's uh, obviously, uh, it's not all accomplished behind the wheel. It's what you bring to the table and what you've, you're going to have your legacy in the sports and in the sport itself. And uh, you've done a great job. Um, I can say I've uh, witnessed many, many of your wins and I've seen some great racing. We talked to uh, one of your biggest competitors right here, but... Um, uh, through the years, uh, some of the some of the guys that you uh, you, th you think back and the biggest battles that you had, pretty much with Mitch, is <laughs> <laughs> the ones that really come to mind. But they were they were some of the best battles because I don't I don't think we ever wrecked each other once. Like it was never, you know, if if he was better that night, he was going to win. If I was better that night, I was going to win. And that's how I remembered it. That's how I said it to Mitch. Uh, you guys were the hardest, cleanest racers together. And uh, how you do that in the fields that you raced against and on the speedways you raced against, um, that tr shows the true uh, Hall of Fame capabilities that you had. All in all, it's been great to have you here with us and, and your family. Welcome to the NISCA Hall of Fame. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, and everybody that... I didn't think I would ever get <laughs> nominated for this thing, so I appreciate everything everybody does, and this deal is really cool. I was always a NISCA member my, my whole time, and um, it's, it's just great, and I appreciate all my family and friends coming as well. Well deserved. Ladies and gentlemen, our most recent inductee, the natural Dale Plank. Oh, I got the name natural because I was terrible when I started. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's naturally. Well, we got one more to go. And as Shane made mention earlier, an international flavor to our Hall of Fame. I made mention off the onset. There, the NISCA Hall of Fame, many diverse different members, drivers, owners, asphalt, dirt, whether it whoever it is, whoever has been enshrined into the Hall of Fame, has left their mark and their legacy in our sport. The next one is going to be only the second inductee to the NISCA Hall of Fame from north of the border, joining Pete Bicknell in our Hall of Fame. The next Hall of Famer and the second Canadian, Canada Joe, Joe Plasek. Shane Andrews is going to do the induction. I'll hand it back over to the voice. You got to watch that wire. I see that. Yeah. My bag of tricks. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. How about a round of applause for Dan Martin, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> see, we haven't started hot laps on our coloring contest. <laughs> I beg your indulgence for just a moment here. I got to 
get something set up. <clears throat> it's uh, kind of cool that all these pictures are here, and I'll, I'll share with you in just a moment why. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome all of our friends from the great country of Canada that are here with us today and the family members that came to uh, join and honor Joe Plazic for his induction here today. His wife, Susan, his daughter, Fallon, his granddaughter, Octavia, and his son, Jeff. We welcome you here today. Thank you for coming down. We also want to uh, welcome longtime crewman and a great friend of Joe Plazic's, Ken McAllister. So uh, thank you. Um, how about a round of applause for him, ladies and gentlemen? Now I know why they started the, uh, the high bar cars and uh, modifieds. Uh, Jeffrey, what are you, 6'6"? Six, six? Uh, eh, give or take an inch, you know. <laughs> well, we can't miss you. My gosh, man. Wow. If I was only that tall, I wouldn't be bald. <laughs> um, I want to share a little story with you here before I get started. You know, growing up in uh, central New York, we had the opportunity to go to a lot of racetracks as a family throughout the years. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit of, of a story. A very diversified household, okay, of race fans in my house. You had my brother John, who was a Bob McCready fan. You had my brother Wayne, Dave Lape fan. Myself, as everybody pretty much knows and has been documented, Jumpin' Jack Johnson fan. But there was someone in our house that uh, hold very near and dear to my heart, my mom, Barb, who took us to the races, and we would make treks all over, whether it was Fonda, Rolling Wheels, Canandaigua, the New York State Fairgrounds. It was an annual pilgrimage to go up to the fairgrounds for Fourth of July and Labor Day to watch the races. And uh, my mom always had a favorite driver, too. And today, with all these pictures up here, I think it's kind of uh, fitting that I show you this, because her favorite driver, I have the opportunity to induct into the New York State Stock Car Association Hall of Fame. And this is a picture that she's uh, had on the wall of her house for a number of years, and she let me borrow it today so I could uh, help with the induction as uh, Joe Plazic was my mom's favorite driver. So I'm just going to put this here. In the history of dirt modified racing in the Northeast, many have made an impression, but only few have left the legacy that is worthy of Hall of Fame induction. No matter how long a racing career spans, the impact the driver has is measured by stories, memories, and accolades. At their peak and in their prime, let's be honest, the Plazic Auto Recyclers race team was big time before big time was even big time. Who here remembers the first time they saw that big white tractor trailer emblazoned with the red number one and Canadian flag prominently displayed on the side pulling into a pit area? In 1993, they were the first dirt modified team to bring in a big stacker hauler on the circuit. Memories that still resonate to this day. How can you forget the number one with the Canadian flag on the side of the car? As he was simply referred to as Canada Joe, as a symbol of his patriotism to the country he loved and proudly represented. The iconic number one with Canadian flag came from the old Harley Davidson logo with the American flag in the middle of it. An idea Joe had to represent his country. The rest is history. An iconic sight to all of us dirt big block modified fans. Raised in Castor Center, Ontario, Canada, Joe Plaza came from a racing family. His dad, Ed, and mom, Marilyn, are what Joe calls redneck race car people, who to this day have the same passion for the sport that they had even before their son started to compete. Growing up in the salvaging car business, it only seemed natural that the desire to compete and grow successful was embedded in Joe at a young age. Joe was originally drawn to motorcycles, and that passion came from a picture of his grandfather on a Harley Davidson motorcycle while serving in the Army in Europe. At the age of seven, Joe saw this, and that was his inspiration. Drawn to bikes, he developed a desire to compete in motocross. At the age of 12, Joe pestered Dave Bramwell, who was a manager at their, at their salvage yard, so much about racing motocross that 
Finally, on a Friday afternoon, Dave said to him, have your stuff ready to go Sunday morning, and took him to Durham, Ontario. That Sunday at 6 a.m., they took off for Joe to compete in his first motocross. Joe ran his first moto and worked himself into such a frenzy that he did not race the second moto. After that first time, Joe settled in and competed in motocross from the age of 12 to 16. After many bumps, bruises, and broken wrists, and from the urging of his parents, as they did not like him racing the bikes, they decided to go auto racing. It was 1977 at the very fast asphalt track Cayuga Speedway. The previous year's champion of the compact division, Bruce Greenhall, had his car for sale. It was a gremlin that Bruce's dad, Jack, owned and was looking to sell. Joe and his dad went up to their place and looked at the car. Jack and Mr. Plazek made a deal. And Jack said, I don't know if the kid can drive. Let him try it. If he crashes it, you own it. $5,000 later, the Plazeks had a race car. Joe went out and bought a new suit, new helmet, new driving experience with no driving experience but the determination to give it a try. His first night out, he started last in his heat race, the green flies, and he passed a few cars and he got to thinking, this is easy. What is everyone talking about this being so tough? Out of turn two, Joe broke loose, spins the car out into the infield and clips one of the light stands with the back of the car and tears the rear bumper right off it. No sooner than this happened in the pits, Jack Greenhall looked at Joe's dad and spoke, you own yourself a race car now. Mr. Plaza hung his head and thought, what have I gotten myself into? For the 1977 and 78 seasons, Joe's com Joe competed in the compact division. In 1979, the track combined the compact class and super weights together. With the power and weight difference, they were not competitive. Mid-season of 79, they bought a late model, again from Jack Greenhall, and started running late models for the rest of the year. They did okay, some engine trouble, but gained a bunch of experience. At the end of the 79 season, it was decided to park the car, and that was an end to Plazic Racing Team, for now. A new decade rolled in, and Joe decided he did not want to race. He wanted to enjoy life and work in the salvage yard business. Go out on the boat, hang out with friends, but like any great competitor, the desire never went away. In 1982, Gord Bradshaw, who worked for the Plazix, had a dirt car that he raced at Merrittville and Humberstone Speedways. It was an old asphalt compact that he ran in the limited sportsman class with an inline six motor. Gord wanted Joe to drive, but Joe had no interest in driving, so Gord asked Joe's father, Ed, to drive it. Ed would race and Joe went and crewed for him. His dad ran a couple of races, then one weekend, Joe's brother Frank had a softball tournament that his parents took him to, but were not going to be able to make it back in time to race the car. Mr. Plazic called Joe at the house and said, you run the car tonight, because we're not going to make it back. Joe raced it that night and told his dad he loved it, and you are not getting me out of the car, I am going to drive. Joe liked the dirt so much that in 1983, he jumped over to the Modifieds on the advice of Junior Hanley. And after a few calls to Troy, Maynard Troyer, Joe picked up a new chassis. That was the chassis from the Parts Peddler Show that winter. They bought a big black engine and started to build it for the 83 season. Joe had no idea about putting a Modified together, so he went to Florida to the races at Volusia and East Bay where the Modifieds were running. He took his camera and he took a lot of pictures of Alan Johnson, Jack Johnson, and Merv Treichler to look at their cars and to see how they did things to build the cars. That is how he got started in Dirt Modifieds. His efforts were focused on Ransomville on Friday, Merrittville on Saturday, and Humberstone on Sunday. Joe calls this an eye-opener and tough grind for a team that never did this before. But the real eye-opener and challenge came in the late fall of 83 when the decision was made to start racing in Western and Central New York. This all came about as that year, Joe and Jim Begelow, who raced against each other every week, were chasing the Rookie of the Year title. Back then, if you wanted to win Rookie of the Year, you had to run the Cam 2 Tour in the fall. The Plazics decided that they wanted to go after this. They were not really prepared, but wanted to give it a try. Labor Day, they blew a motor on the mile, changed motors, went to rolling wheels that night, finished in the top 10, closing in on Begelow and rookie points. 
But when they returned home, they looked at the motor and saw more damage and did not pursue the rest of the tour as Jim Begelow became Rookie of the Year. From this point on, race fans in Western and Central New York would become familiar with Joe Plazic as he built a following of fans to this day still reminisce of his talents on the local tracks. Thanks to his winning ways, professional team, and desire to have success. Super Dirt Car Series wins came at Burton, Rolling Wheels, and Canandaigua. He competed at Canandaigua, his home track, where track titles came in 96 and 97, a track title at Weedsport in 95, and the place where Joe really made his mark, the New York State Fairgrounds. On the mile, Joe captured three state Labor Day wins from 95 to 97, two triple 20 qualifying wins, and two fast time pole awards for the 358 modified race. From 1993 to 1997, Joe locked in the top seven every year during this time frame, including setting fast time and starting on the front rows in 1993 and 97. Joe reflects back, I really thought that 97 was going to be our year. Despite sitting on the front row and winning one of the triple 20s, he got into a late race jingle that essentially ended his day. Starting in 1998, Joe cut back his racing endeavors to focus on a growing family and successful business. After a limited schedule of events in 99 and 2000, Joe Plazic decided it was time to step away from big block modified racing. Joe compares racing modifies to climbing Mount Everest. Once you get to the top, where is there to go? There is no real stepping stone from the modifieds. Joe did not want to try the NASCAR deal like those before him, as they always came back to the Modifieds. He did not want this to be his destiny. The carrot was not there to chase. Joe went asphalt racing in the Cast Car Super Series in 2002, becoming the series rookie of the year that season. After one season with Cast Car, he decided to call it a career. But don't think that racing has completely left him. As his son Michael is dabbling in the Enduro class, where did Joe's surprise sees that his son has some talent behind the wheel. With his wife of 39 years, Susan, they have five children, Mark, Michael, Fallon, Joel, and Jeffrey, and enjoy time with their four grandchildren. Three of his boys race motocross, following in their dad's footsteps, and all are involved in the family salvage business. Joe spends his time now with his family, riding his motorcycle, and snowmobiling in the winter. He has left an indelible mark to all of us in Big Block Modified Racing in Western and Central New York with that iconic number one Plazic Auto Recyclers machine. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the newest member of the New York State Stock Car Association Hall of Fame, Joe Plazic. So again, President Rick Hodge with the plaque presentation, Brian Bedell from Boomer's Performance with the Hall of Fame jacket and hat. Our fifth inductee here this afternoon into the New York State Stock Car Association, Canada Joe, Joe Plazic. And Joe, uh, as you would expect, the, prof the professionalism of my good friend, Shane Andrews, yeah, you don't want to let your picture, yeah, Shane won't be able to see his mom again without that either. He won't, he won't want to go in the house without that picture, I'll tell you. Uh, like I said, the professionalism of Shane uh, kind of documenting your entire career. But one thing that comes to mind with me is the professionalism of the Plastic Racing effort. Um, like Shane said, you were big time before big time was big time. Um, I was a kid from down here on the east end of the state. We didn't get to see you much until it was time uh, when you come to Lebanon Valley for the Lebanon Valley 200, part of the Cam 2 trail back then. Um, you rolled into the pits with that hauler and that big white truck and, and trailer. The iconic Canadian flag number one that anybody from that era with those memories will never forget. It was, that was big time. Um, your performance 
did as much as the appearance. Um, you certainly knew how to get around any racetrack. When we would make the trip out to Super Dirt Week, um, I, you could probably tell me, I don't know if Shane might have even said, but how many times uh, on Thursday you were sitting in front of the, the building as one of the quick six. Uh, the Labor Day race, the same thing. Um, you had a special epitome for the, uh, the Moody Mile. Well, I think that all started when we first went down. And uh, I mean, we weren't always good there. We, were, we struggled just like everybody else does. And we were uh, a back marker. And, and uh, it just it, it became an obsession to get faster at the Moody Mile. Um, we worked hard at it. And uh, it showed in the end. Well, certainly showed us. Uh, then making it, the Canandaigua was your home on Saturday nights. Um, today they call it Land of Legends for a reason. Um, you raced against some of the best that there were and ever will be on the dirt circuit. Um, whether it was Barefoot Bob, whether it was the Johnson brothers, uh, that, that list went on and on. Steve Payne, um, that was a, a career move right there to make your way down there and race with those names. I'm sure a lot of, that's where a lot of that knowledge came from. Well, when I, start, when I was starting out in like 83, 84, I ended, had a crew chief, Mike Hillman Sr. And uh, Mike said, if you don't run against the best guys, you're never going to become the best guy. So um, we just started, you know, we started traveling to Central New York and, um, and we were in like a 15th place car. And it, it, you know, then it was 10th and then it was 8th. And, and then we were a top five car for a long time before we started winning. But once we started to win, then it, uh, we learned to win, I guess. And Hellman went, went on to have a pretty good career, too. And his son's done pretty well, too. I think two of the sons, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Uh, again, take us, uh, I talk about, and I, I talked to Shane earlier and referred to, I didn't realize the, the Canadian number one and going back to the Harley Davidson number one, and that all makes sense now, and that, uh, that was pretty ingenious on your own part. But that itself, you wore that like a badge of honor. And, you know, today, Shane and myself talked about that before this, when we had our meetings to do to his speech. Uh, um, that number's iconic. It, it's, and I, I, I mean, I don't mind when, when somebody wants to use it, but uh, I like to be asked. Um, because, uh, I mean, some of the stuff that um, Stuart Friesen's done with uh, some of the numbers on his NASCAR truck is really cool. But um, I, I like to, you know, that number is kind of like a symbol now of, of, of plastic racing, right? So. Well, indeed it is, and it's yours. <laughs> um, speaking of the pl plastic racing, your background and all, I know the, uh, the story back in the day, the plastic recyclers, uh, you guys were the first, if not the only one with the paved roads around your, your lot that, you know, some of us think about going out. Uh, I started as a street stock racer, the, the kid that goes out to, to get tie rods and spindles and comes home with more bee stings than he does parts. Um, but you guys, it, the professionalism is much more than your race career. Yeah, our salvage yard is, is second to none in the area. Like da dad was a, well still is, he, he's uh, a stickler on tidiness and, uh, you know, he said, you can't sell it if you can't find it, right? That was his motto years ago. And um, he just, he, so that kind of just filtered over into the racing. It just had to be nice, had to be clean and uh, well kept, right? So Can't sell it if you can't find it before computerized inventory. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I go back to like, uh, we use Cardexes and tubs, right? Now it's all, uh, you know, my kids are now all online and doing everything, you know, they, they can sit at their desk at home and sell parts, right? So. I asked Mitch and I asked Dale, some of the guys that you look back and think about who you raced against, some of the hardest nosed competitors. Um, you, like I, I just dropped a couple of names of Hall of Famers that now you're a Hall of Famer and you race against some of the best. Some of the memories? Uh, well, yeah, there's a bunch. Uh, I think the best one I got is uh, Merv Treichler. Uh, I was always a fan of Merv's when I was young. And he, he raced Cuga Speedway and he, you know, I, I was a fan of Merv's and then I got to race against him. And uh, I remember one night at uh, Ranceville, I beat him for, uh, I think it was, I think Alan won, but we were battling for second. I beat Merv for second. And he came over and said to me, you raced way too hard. And that was kind of neat coming from Merv Trichler, right? So, Feather in your cap right there. Well, yeah, it was kind of neat. It was, uh, yeah, but it was a true story. He came over and said, you, you, you raced way too hard. I went, I come from motocross. Like we used to run 45 minute motos, right? So that's not racing hard. 
And then uh, with, with the two-wheel history, they say with uh, ages bring cages and uh, on to bigger and better things. And uh, I'd like to say it worked out pretty good for you. I've got a motocrosser here, Jeffrey, and, uh, and he's uh, kind of retired because of the, the ages and cages kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, certainly. We want to congratulate you on behalf of all of us here at the New York State Stock Car Association and uh, you, part of a very fi special five-person group here in 2024. Congratulations and welcome to the NISCA Hall of Fame. Thank you for everybody coming out on a great day. <laughs> Remind you of Syracuse, didn't it? <laughs> all right, ladies and gentlemen, that is our fifth and final inductee to the NISCA Hall of Fame here for the class of 2024. Again, I would like to thank everybody on behalf of the New York State Stock Car Association and everything that we do. Thank you for coming out and joining us. It hasn't been the, the most pleasant day to come. I, I am sure that uh, kind of took its toll on the crowd. want to thank once again Jackie Lape uh, for uh, everything that uh, she has done to make us feel at home here. We look forward to coming back again. Uh, Jackie, her daughter Jessica. Jackie uh, shared some news with me a little bit earlier that uh, Jessica is going to make her a grandma. So, congratulations. And uh, a, big, a big part of Jessica's life is about to change. And uh, I know Jackie's will as well. So, congratulations. Couldn't happen to uh, a couple of nicer people. With that said, that is going to put a wrap on today's program. We thank you for coming out. I'd like to personally congratulate all of our inductees. I did talk to, as I said, uh, Jack Burgess's son uh, was supposed to be here. He wanted to thank everybody and everybody in the organization for remembering his dad. We uh, remember Jack Burgess as a Hall of Fame inductee, Joe Murata, Dale Plank, Mitch Gibbs, and Canada Joe, Joe Plasek. That, a very impressive group of five, and uh, welcome into the Hall of Fame. We look forward to being back. Yes, photographs, I'm sorry. Uh, I want to make sure everybody gets an opportunity to come up. We want a group photo of our five inductees, and uh, you folks are more than welcome to get any photos that you want to have here. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming out and joining us here today. Um, have a safe ride home. Uh, we'll see you again soon at the track.